Um, so my name is Jess Diamond Stone, and um, I'm the facilitator tonight um, for both the first half of the evening, which is a panel discussion, and the second half, which is a compassionate communication workshop. Um, on behalf of Compassion Brattleboro, I welcome you all and extend much gratitude to all of you for coming out to participate in this important discussion. Um, uh, in particular, I'd like to uh, thank Maria from um, Brattleboro Community TV. Maria is filming us tonight, and um, I have signed a waiver allowing that to happen for everyone. Is there anyone who has a problem with that? It's a waiver to be filmed tonight. I just wanted to make sure, yes, uh, for, uh, for public TV. Just want to check and make sure. Okay, great. Um, so, um, there's one of our panelists is missing. So I'm a little distracted. Somebody's walking through the door. And I don't know what the panelist looks like. Are you Phoebe? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now we are complete. Hi, Phoebe. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Jess. <laughs> Phoebe's Welcome. driven down from Middlebury to speak with us tonight. So, yes. Thank you so much. Um, so, before we begin, how about just saying hello to the person next to you? Thanking them for coming out and being involved in this conversation tonight. Introduce yourself. Before introducing our panelists, <clears throat> I'd like to read <clears throat> a definition of compassion. And, along, uh, uh, and also, along with that, the key questions that Doug Cox, thank you Doug, has put together for us, which will focus uh, us through the conversation tonight. Um, and I, I'll also very briefly go over the timing of the evening because we have two parts to the, uh, to the program. So, uh, compassion, deep awareness of the suffering of another coupled with the wish to relieve it. So, I have, we have five key questions and I do have them written down on small pieces of paper. If people would like to look at those once I've read them, if you think that would be useful, let me know and we'll pass them out. If it's cumbersome, we'll just pass over that. So the first question, climate change is putting many people in the world under stress, physically, culturally, and emotionally. As we go through this, what are the opportunities to grow in our compassion? And what are the challenges that these will put upon us, upon our compassion? <coughs> the second one is Brattleboro is one small part of the world. As we seek to be more compassionate, what can we as a community do to be compassionate, responsible citizens of the world? The third one is, are our current considerations of climate change improperly human-centric? If so, how does this appear in our thoughts and conversations? What is the value of expanding compassion to other animals and life forms and to the global evolution? Number four. Our current political landscape poses challenges to establishing consensus policies on global warming. How does loving our enemies and living the principles of compassion shape our political debate? And the fifth one is, at what point does our concern for the environment overwhelm our hope? And how does compassion for ourselves and those suffering despair work? When is it more important than compassion for others? So those are the five questions that we have this evening. And um, 
I'm wondering if people would like those written, or would that be helpful? If you um, would like to take it home, please do so. And if you uh, are not going to take it home, we will recycle them and use them at the next uh, climate conversation next month. So um, lastly, before introducing our panelists, just a very brief um, explanation of uh, the timing for our evening. Um, we'll have an hour for the panel discussion. Each panelist will speak for a few, for about eight, nine minutes. And um, uh, I, I have a hard time interrupting people when I'm a timekeeper, so I will be handing them a stone, which is a summary stone. They'll, so if you see me handing a stone, it's just our little code that says it's time to wrap up. That way I don't have to interrupt what they're saying. Um, and uh, after each um, panelist speaks, there'll be about five minutes for everyone to um, pose questions to that one panelist. And um, at uh, the end of an hour, we will give a question. Five, did you say five minutes? Five minutes for each panelist. So each panelist will speak for about 10. There'll be, for each one, one or two questions, and then we'll move to the next panelist. Yeah. And um, after the hour is ended, we will um, reorganize in a large circle in group three um, for us, everyone, to practice a little bit of compassionate communication around the issues that have been raised by our panelists. So, without further ado, um, let me introduce our panelists. I dropped my glasses. <clears throat> uh, Patty Smith from the Bonnyvale Environmental Center in West Brattleboro is an environment, e environmental educator and wildlife rehabilitator. Patty will consider key questions on compassion and climate change as they pertain to our local ecological systems. I, um, Patty, each panelist will choose one or two of the five questions to address. Um, Phoebe Brown has traveled from Middlebury College where she is a student and a member of Middlebury's chapter of Sunrise, a national climate action organization. Phoebe, Phoebe will reflect with us on tonight's key questions as they relate to statewide issues. Christopher Gaynor lives here in Brattleboro and is a master's degree student studying climate change and sustainable development. Christopher will share with the, with the perspective of a macro worldview on climate change as they pertain to our key questions. And Laurel Green from Rockingham, is that right, Laurel? Is a farmer turned climate activist. Much of her work is based on the research in Paul Hawkins' book, Draw Down. Laurel, too, will be offering a macro worldview as it pertains to our key questions and bring it back around to our local ecology. Patty, I wonder what Patty. question. Hi. Yes. Um, what question or questions did you um, choose to um, respond to? So, of course, the question that I chose to answer, one more push, is Are our current considerations of climate change improperly human centric? If so, how does this appear in our thoughts and conversations? What is the value of expanding compassion to other animals and life forms and to global evolution? And that's the only question I feel qualified to talk about. Well, I'm not really much of a talker to begin with, which isn't usually a problem because, as some of you know, I spend most of my time with, I just found this on the shelves behind us, porcupines and beavers. And they, they really don't mind that I'm not much of a talker. However, 
because of the climate crisis and because the sand is trickling through the hourglass and our time to act is diminishing rapidly, I decided that I would come and talk to you tonight, you compassionate brattle burrowins. Is that what you call yourselves? Okay. <clears throat> so, 10 years ago, I decided I was going to make friends with a moose. <laughs> yes, well, I had already spent two years getting to know a family of beavers, and I decided it was time to move on, and besides, I had just heard that there's a particular time in a moose's life when they're very amenable to making friends with almost anyone. And that time is when the yearling moose are being kicked out by their mother. Now, mother has been taking very good care of them. They've been inseparable for a whole year. And when she tells the youngster to go, that young moose is devastated. So I decided I was going to find a moose like this in my big wild backyard that summer. And I see you laughing, Mike, but there were lots of moose tracks out there, lots of moose tracks, and I saw a moose, you know, occasionally, so it was a little far-fetched. But that year, I actually had really magical experiences with two lonely teenage moose. The first one was just an evening where we hung out together. But then I met the moose that I call Terrible Jack. And we were actually pals, good pals, for a couple of weeks. And Terrible Jack would come up and touch my hand with his nose and follow me through the woods and take naps next to me. And it was always a challenge to keep him from following me home. I knew that would not be a good idea. The last time I saw a moose in my woods in Marlboro was five years ago when a neighbor called me and said, there is a moose acting weird hanging out in my backyard. It's just standing there. So I went over, and sure enough, there was a moose just standing there. I went back a few days later and saw that it had moved off, and I followed its tracks. And um, it headed off through a beaver pond and marsh, and I finally came back around toward where it had been before and stepped over a stone wall. And as happens when I'm tracking, I'm just looking at the tracks and there's a big skid mark and you know what I found and that was the the body of that moose on the other side of the stone wall with its head down by the brook and I don't see moose tracks in my woods anymore I see deer tracks I see a lot more deer tracks and deer carry a parasite that affects moose the reason I'm seeing more deer in my woods and fewer moose is because of climate change Deer did not do well in Marlboro back in the days when we had real winters. And uh, now the deer do well and the moose really don't. So I consider moose our first, first uh, loss to the climate crisis in the woods of Marlboro. And uh, you know, they are the true innocents. So I went to the climate rally in Montpelier two years ago, marking the first 100 days of our illustrious president's uh, reign. And I was really, really excited to see all of those people there. And I listened to the speakers and I said, these people understand that we need to make systemic changes rooted in uh, social justice and democratic principles if we're going to save this planet. But by the end of the day, I was really discouraged because almost no one was mentioning other life forms. There was no despair over the disappearing moose. There was no outrage for the suffering of the polar bears and the loss of coral reefs. It was all very human-centered. And I really felt doom around that. And I've noticed the same phenomenon around coverage of uh, climate crises, you know, hurricanes and fires and floods. There's always coverage of the devastation as it affects human beings, but never any mention of the loss of the forests and how the wildlife in those burning forests are coping or how the endemic birds on those tropical islands are being affected. I decided to write an article myself on one of these tropical bird species and 
I could not find any information at all about how these birds were impacted. So I, I wrote a story based on my best imagination of what I would do if I was a Barbuda warbler on this pancake flat island when gosh darn Hurricane Irma came and sat there with 185 mile per hour winds for hours and hours and hours. What does a little bird do? I don't know. I know some of them did live. So, um, yes, I, I was pretty discouraged. I'm sure some of you have heard about the biologist E.O. Wilson, and he has this uh, biophilia hypothesis that suggests that all of humanity feels a deep and primal connection to nature and other living things. And when I first read that book, probably 15 years ago, I said, hmm, I don't know. I was a little skeptical because I was not seeing that everywhere. And, you know, if you look at certain people in our world today, like the person in the Oval Office, it's a little hard to believe that everyone has a primal connection to nature. But I, I um, recently have been changing my mind about that. In the last year, I have really been marveling at the audacity of the speakers who are talking about the real changes we need to make. And specifically, I was at the climate rally on Friday last week. Oh my god. I was in tears. That was so exciting. And there were so many signs about the rest of life on Earth, protecting biodiversity. And in the speeches up at the Common, Someone called out beavers and possums in particular, you know, two of my favorites. And uh, then there was the comment that the reformer picked up as their headline by the young speaker, Django, who's going to be here next week, I understand. He said, we are the Lorax. And you know what that means. If we are the Lorax, we speak for the trees, and we speak for the brown barbaloots, and we speak for the swami swans. So I was just very happy about all of that. So the first part of that question again is, are our considerations of climate change improperly human-centric? And I'm really hoping the answer to that is not as much as they used to be. So the next part of the question is, what's the value of expanding compassion to other animal life forms and to global evolution? And I had something to say about that. Let's see, down here. So, there are two reasons why it's important to consider the welfare of other species when we're thinking about climate change, and the first is, of course, the human-centric one. Uh, we humans know an awful lot now about how the planet works, how natural systems evolved and create the life support systems that we all depend on, pollination, soil fertility, the ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're pretty good on those basic things. But we don't begin to understand how it really works. We do not really know the nuts and bolts at all. Um, one of the great pioneers of conservation, and a fabulous writer, Aldo Leopold, said that to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution. <laughs> oh, here she comes with this summary stone. Is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. Therefore, if we really want to keep the living earth alive, we must keep track of every cog and wheel. And to ignore them, we do so at our own peril. Um, <laughs> Yet, despite the importance of the rest of life, it seems that there is a taboo against mentioning any other species of the fate of nature in the face of human suffering. And I am going to argue that we need to change that. Um, we fear being accused of caring more about penguins than people. But we ignore the needs of other life at our own peril. In fact, I think it's very important that we put the needs of all of life before the needs of any particular person or group of people. But I don't feel that these things are mutually exclusive. 
we can be preparing to save the habitat that's needed for other species at the same time as we're welcoming climate migrants. We just have to be sure that we're planning carefully and being compassionate. In fact, there are a lot of groups working on this right now. I'll mention just two of them. There's E.O. Wilson's Half Earth Group, and their goal is to create an ecological reserve that is half of the planet Earth, uh, the land and waters. And the other group that I've been aware of and thinking about this week is one called the Campaign for Nature, and they're really blowing ahead. They're hoping that by next year they can persuade a lot of government leaders to conserve 30% of the Earth's oceans and lands for nature. It has to be done strategically. It can't be just any land. So I'm going to wrap up with one final thought, which is, uh, well, the other reason, of course, is not the human-centered reason. It's love. And we really will fight fiercely and bravely for the things that we love. To address the climate crisis in the way that gives us the best chance of saving our planet, we must not only give permission to love all of life, but we must do everything we can to nurture that love. Thank you, Patty. Um, we have five minutes now for questions, specifically to Patty. Would somebody like the mic? So we're, we're asked to have it close to, just under our lip, almost like we're sipping tea. Where do you think we should start? Oh boy, that, that, is the tough, <laughs> that is the tough question. And um, I noticed that uh, oh, we can start with something as simple as this. I was over at Mount Metastica gathering uh, acorns for a porcupine. Closer to Mike. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, gathering acorns for a porcupine that I have in custody right now, and I picked some of this sweet fern that grows over there and I'm just gonna pass it around because it has an amazing smell and if we can just remember to immerse ourselves in the natural world and share it with everyone else that's a place to start and it's it's not the whole answer obviously but I also feel like in what way is it the answer? only I mean, two is it something that, they can, that everybody can eat? Oh, no, you can't eat it, but you can enjoy it. And you can say, yes, that's part of the world that I want to see. Oh, I see, yeah. Um, so talk about and ask about how um, climate-related disasters are affecting all of life and just spread whatever compassion you feel for other creatures. And if you need some advice on that, I can certainly provide it. Go for it. <laughs> oh, well, you could gather some acorns for me. As a wildlife rehabilitator, I am in the sometimes awkward position of justifying spending my own time and resources to care for things like baby squirrels. And you have to say, well, isn't that the compassionate thing to do if an animal is orphaned and suffering? Um, so just to reframe some of those discussions. And there are people like me who will do it, so you don't have to feel like you'll, you need to do all of it yourself. Well, as far as squirrels are concerned, last winter we had squirrels coming out of our ears. Not anymore. Well, I don't know what happened, but at the beginning of the winter, it was yeah. everywhere. That's, yeah. that's a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Oh, oh, right, you don't have the mic anymore. So, yes, we did have a, a major crash of the squirrel population last year because for three years it had been growing and growing lots of good things to eat, and then last year there was nothing, nothing. And so they were doing all kinds of crazy things and getting into places where people didn't want them to be, and that was a, a situation where they certainly could have used some compassion because a lot of them were starving to death, and that's... They depend on nut crops in the fall to get ready for winter, yeah. 
Okay, good, thank you, yes. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you again, Patty. Um, so, I think it's time to pass the mic on to Phoebe. And um, Phoebe, what questions uh, have you chosen to address tonight? Um, I, I chose to look at the first and last question, so to, um, I want to generally kind of talk about challenges to compassion, how we can grow compassion in the context of statewide climate activism. Um, and then also the last question was kind of about how we balance hope, despair, self-compassion, and kind of selflessness, it seemed like to me. Um, I guess I want to start with a little, like we're all coming here from very different places and we bring a lot of life with us. So I was born and raised in Utah. Uh, this is my second semester at Middlebury College, so I've only been in Vermont for like four months. This is my first time seeing fall on the East Coast. The drive down here was ridiculous, because I'm from the desert part of Utah. We don't have trees. Um, uh, and a lot of the kind of climate work I've been involved with so far in um, Vermont, I was part of the climate march that happened last spring, where we went 65 miles from Middlebury to Montpelier. So through that, I got to communicate with a lot of people, and then I've been part of a couple different strikes and rallies. Um, and then also the club I'm in at college um, talks to people in town a lot. And so just through my experience talking to people, I think kind of the big points um, I would like you all to leave here with are one that I think to, to really face this problem, we have to work on erasing in our minds this idea of binary and of things existing in isolation because I think we live in a time where nothing really exists in isolation more. So we can't talk about saving children from starvation in Yemen without talking about the health of our oceans, without talking about air pollution in New York City, that kind of um, thing. And then I think that kind of translate into compassion as well, where we can't we, I think fear and compassion and hope and hate all come from a place of love and, uh, right, so those things don't exist in isolation either. The other big point I would like to impress upon all of you is that in what I've noticed, people who care about the climate tend to fall into two groups, young people and old people. And my parents' generation is pretty much missing from the conversation. I see a few exceptions here, but what I'd like you all to leave here with is, I'd like you all to know that the young people in the world and in Vermont are scared and angry, and those things are not without compassion as well. But I think that is, um, Bill McKibben is a person who is associated with Middlebury College, and I've gotten to hear him speak a couple times, and he talks a lot about how like this uh, the balance of this being kind of the time for the youth to speak, um, but also as youth recognizing this is, a, we have to learn from people who have been there before us. And I think I personally have learned a lot. Um, for me, it's very powerful, the idea that, you know, all we have to do is one thing. All we have to do is completely change our society. But that's happened in living memory, right? <laughs> Like, my, I have a grandfather who grew up in the South, segregated, right? That would, like, he remembers that. Uh, so, so I think in that sense, there's hope that kind of goes along with anger. Um, and so, yeah, I would ask you all to just keep in mind the idea of sending down the lessons that I'm sure you will have uh, while also supporting us in our attempt to save the world, really. I think one of, the, one of the things that has most impressed me my time in Vermont is that we had a town hall in Middlebury and a, um, a middle school girl got up in front of 200 people and cried because in 10 years she's going to be 23. Her life won't even be a quarter over before the conservative figure for when the worst of the climate apocalypse is going to kind of start to happen. Um, so then, I guess kind of moving into compassion and how things work at a statewide level, I think again, one of the biggest challenges to compassion is frustration for me. And a really frustrating part about the climate crisis is that it's just so, so uneven. This, I mean, 
just the scale of a, a person or a community or a state or a country compared to like a planetary system, just, you know, mass-wise, we can't compare necessarily. It's, it's, not, it's not a fair fight to begin with. Even if we went to zero emissions now, we would experience lag. You know, things would still get worse even if we did our very best right now. Um, so that can be frustrating, and then also just on a like political and social level, things can be frustrating because we are people, and our politicians are people too, but because of the power structures we formed in this country, they have a lot more power. And it's in this sense that climate change is an indigenous issue, and climate change is an issue of race, and climate change is an issue of gender, because of the power structures that kind of the actions we have to take are within and the power structures we have to work through. Um, and so that's something that the youth are thinking a lot about at the moment. Um, that I, I don't know if I could leave you all with kind of that nugget uh, that we're scared and we need to think about the system we're working in. Um, and I guess compassion wise, the, the idea of listening um, and urgency. And then I guess, can I open up for questions now? Because I feel like I've said a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. just going to hand you the stone. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't worry about me. I'm quite old and won't live that long, but I have great grandchildren and I really worry about my children and my grandchildren, particularly my great grandchildren if we don't fix things. Go ahead, Phoebe. Oh. I'll pass this on to the next person. <laughs> but you go ahead. If you want to respond oh. to that. Or maybe I, there is no response. Uh, I, I guess, thank you. If we don't, my generation, this generation doesn't fix it, their generation is yeah, so something, um, she was just kind of talking about like the idea of thinking generationally and how maybe my generation's not going to suffer, but the future will. Um, and I, I guess in response, I'd say I, where I come from in the American Southwest, a lot of Native American culture is very prevalent and um, something that the indigenous people in the community I come from talk about is the idea of time not necessarily happening the way that we've been taught linearly, but different beliefs about how there are multiple timelines occurring at once. Uh, and so, yeah, I think they have an idea of generations and world systems and the way humans fit into part of a world system, not on top, not over or below the system, if that makes sense. That just kind of reminded me of what you said. I, I may have misunderstood you. I've been sitting here trying to think. You said the only people that care are the young people and the old people. Well, who else is there? Or are you saying people in the middle don't care? The only people who do care are the young people and the old people. Are you saying there's a group that doesn't care? And how do you def what is that group, if I'm reading you right, uh, and why doesn't that group care? So I think it's not necessarily about caring, but it's about who shows up. So if you look at who is at climate strikes, it is college students, high school students, and then retired people. And people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s aren't showing up, which is problematic because they have a lot of economic power, they have a lot of social power, they have kids, you know? So um, I think a lot of that is who has jobs and who doesn't have jobs. Uh, but showing up is really important, you know, and that's something, like, I've been trying to talk to my parents about, like, they didn't leave work. I, I left school, you know? So, I guess it's, I don't know. I think, I think it's important for each person to, right, so one of the, part of the question was talking about self-compassion and uh, kind of taking, it seemed like a self-care versus caring for others, um, and I think, it's important to keep in mind that we are not as individuals trying to solve the climate crisis, we are as a community trying to solve the climate crisis. 
Um, and so thinking, you know, the Paris Climate Accord said each state to their means, to the best of their abilities, is supposed to take this on. I think that goes the same for individuals, but I just wanted to make the point that there is a whole generation that isn't showing up right now. I'm sure they care, but just the numbers, they just aren't there. What I'm struck by is how um, the conversations that are uh, um, stimulated by our panelists, it, we're just um, touching the surface. And um, it would be lovely to have a long, luxurious afternoon um, with each one of these panelists to really um, reap the rewards of their knowledge and experiences and inspiration. So um, I look forward to, to seeing how everybody takes this, this home and processes it and um, how the words that Phoebe has shared um, continue to resonate. So, and Patty. And now let me uh, introduce to you, uh, well, I've already introduced to you, Chris. Um, Chris, what questions have you uh, decided to focus your presentation on? All right. Um, well, I have elected to choose the first one um, regarding climate change and climate change under stress. And I've also elected to do the third one under, for our current political landscape poses challenges to establishing consensus policies. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, public speaking isn't my forte, so I typed out all of my thoughts. Um, so I'll be like just reading from my from my prompt and like observing all of you in the process. So, gotta really hold it up. There we go. All right. Um, so the prompt that I'm going to to review is: Climate change is putting many people in the world under stress, physically, culturally, and emotionally. As we go through this, what are the opportunities to grow in our compassion? And what are the challenges these changes will put on our compassion? So um, I'd like to use this prompt to tell you a bit about myself and open a space for vulnerability and honesty for a more productive conversation. To begin, I want to identify that, sure, that'd be great. Oh, wow, that's <laughs> teamwork. Uh, to begin, I want to identify that I am of mixed race. My parents are Jamaican, my birth, uh, or my parents are Jamaican by birth with European and African lineage, that's my complexion. Um, within, oh, uh, about my, my parents having both African and European lineage, or the fact that, like, because of that, I have blind light skin. So, yeah. Oh, anywho, uh, within that space of being mixed, I have never been black enough nor white enough to neatly fit in those groups culturally. Um, however, it has been through emotion, through connection. Um, that I've been able to somewhat navigate this world under stress. I begin with this because this is the lens I primarily use when addressing challenges and my feelings. Um, now listed in the announcement is that I am a return Peace Corps volunteer, uh, Tanzania, and an AmeriCorps alum. Um, currently, I'm also the ambassador of the Eco America program of the Southeast region. I have a degree in agriculture engineering along with my pursuit of higher ed and environmental studies, but it isn't my intention to present myself as an expert in any way. I'm a sponge for perspectives and it's very atypical of me uh, to outright say that you're wrong. Um, <laughs> that said, I'd like to think that I am speaking before you because I have been directly and indirectly affected by climate change, like most, of the, most in this room and beyond and like those watching. Um, as a Floridian, because I am native South Floridian, um, I've, been, I've seen the erosion of my childhood beach to where it is no longer the same beach. And of course, you know, record heat waves. Um, as a returned Peace Corps volunteer, I had witnessed the mishandling of national politics that pushed the district that I was into, a hunger district, because international seeds were banned to grow the needed crops for, for my area. As an American, I've experienced a deep, direct loss of a friend as a result of international conflict driven by climactic and political social stressors. I bring attention to this because, frankly, we all have our stories, our backgrounds, and our histories. Opportunities to grow in compassion, especially in the wake of climate change, is listening, acting. 
actively listening to those stories, backgrounds, and histories. Not with the intent to change anyone, but to connect with someone. Compassion can be defined as the sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others. In the world under stress, we can't help but latch onto some semblance of hope and action, throwing blame at those who aren't doing enough. I really appreciate Phoebe bringing attention to the Paris Climate Agreement, saying that to each state within their means. To place the burden of responsibility completely on folks who are doing as much as they can muster, especially as an ally within the climate, social, environmental, racial, animal, economic, justice bubbles, is to completely ignore what it means to be compassionate. Over this past week, even, just for me, I have been engaging with an animal rights activist who has openly called me a hypocrite for not eating exclusively plant-based, despite my involvement and engagement with this global movement of a just transition. They had no interest in hearing what I had to say. They had no interest in hearing my side. They had no interest in having a dialogue. But instead, they told me to shut up about climate change if my mouth is full of meat. Where's the compassion there? I heard a podcast recently where the guest had just finished an interview with a community member of the Midwest in Trump, in quote unquote Trump country, and I thought what they took away from that interview was really eye-opening. Despite the narrative of these folks voting against their best interests, depending on how you define interests, the guest pointed out that of all the presidential candidates over the past 40 years, Trump, for the case of this Midwest, Midwestern community member, was the first to acknowledge the impact and damages caused by deindustrialization. For that person, that recognition over decades of invisibility is powerful. Despite what you may think of, of the man, like this person believes that Trump cares, has pity for, for their community, even though by policy that's not working. When our country folk believe a demagogue holds more compassion than the alternative, we have failed as a national community. Okay. My apologies, I'll slow down, thank you. Yeah, so to close, uh, the challenge, the challenge these changes um, occurring at, uh, oh, excuse me, the challenge these changes occurring at an unimaginable pace bring to our communities a reactionary, defensive, and complicit society that doesn't actually address the deeper whys to systems in place. To love your neighbor means to actually meet them, listen to them. That is how I believe we can best grow within our compassion. And that is my response to the first prompt. So I'll take, I'll take questions for that one, I guess, first. I don't know how this works. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, I guess I'll just shift to the third prompt that I'd answered. Of our current political landscape poses challenges to establishing consensus policies on global warming. How does loving our enemies and living the principles of compassion shape our political day? political debate. Um, I kept this one short and sweet, uh, and I will talk slower. So, um, the politics do not dictate the dialogue, but rather the dialogue is what dictates the, po dictates the politics. Perfect example, what happened over this past weekend with Greta Thunberg, who gave an impassioned speech to the UN Climate Summit. Her speech uplifted by the public displays calling for action prompted countries like that of Russia to finally join the global community, being the last country to pledge to ratify the Paris Climate Agreement. More than 60 countries have pledged to get to net zero by 2050 from that summit. It took 13 days for 196 countries to come to an agreement for the Paris Agreement. Our own country walked away from that agreement. All that squabbling was over politics. Win-wins, quid pro quos. It was a heart-moving speech done by Greta amplified by thousands, and it pushed 60 countries in a weekend. That is social change. That is compassion. That is approaching our communities intentionally, acknowledging, not just sympathizing, acknowledging the serious implications if nothing is done. So it isn't a matter of loving our enemies or like accepting our political adversaries. It's an inherent compulsion to protect our species because at the end, we are all in it together here. So that's my closing closing statement. Thank you, Chris. 
Are there any questions for Chris? Not for Chris, but is there any way that this could be like put on the internet? Is there any way that that could be put on the internet so that people could download it? I mean, I don't, my auditory memory stinks, but if I read it, it makes it easier for me. The program is being filmed by Brattleboro Public TV. I don't think that there's a written script that's being provided for the evening, but certainly anyone with a computer uh, can find the link in the archives and listen to the entire program uh, or find out when it's being aired on TV and watch it. Also, Chris's part of the presentation is in a printed form, and perhaps he would be willing to share what he's written. Would you like, would you like to read it? <laughs> um, let's see, why don't we have a sign-up sheet and people who, yes? Why don't we use the sign-up sheet that's going around of people that are interested, and uh, we will arrange to have it, have the written uh, script, Chris's uh, written script sent to all of you. How about that? What Jim has just suggested is that on the um, piece of paper that's going around that people are um, invited to put their name and contact information on. If you put a note next to your name that you are interested in having a copy of Chris's um, presentation, uh, we will uh, get that to you. Who has not seen this? Who has not seen yeah. it? Do you have a question? Good. Here's a question for you, Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, I thought your presentation was very clear and very erudite. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been struggling with an issue that, that I trust your wisdom on, and I was just wondering if, if I could have your perspective. Um, I'm the minister of the Center Congregational Church, and this Friday, after the rally, um, we hosted um, an event which was sponsored by Vermont 350 and um, Extinction Rebellion. And that event was uh, training for nonviolent um, civil disobedience. And the objective, sort of, of the training, or the immediate objective, is the, um, the protest of the last remaining coal um, uh, plant, electricity plant, in New Hampshire. So, Basically, the, the, the training was, of course, um, it, it, it dealt with um, poles. You have the left and you have the right coming into contestation. And I'm used to, from a historical perspective, civil disobedience being the, the intentional violation of unjust laws. Here we have a little bit different context when it comes to climate change when the civil disobedience is actually the intentional disobedience of just laws. For example, like trespassing, the same, same laws that protect someone from entering into your home are the same laws that are protecting the coal plant. So you have an intentional violation of just laws and because of that, you have the potential for physical and um, criminal contestation. I'm torn um, in terms of compassion when it seems like the only tool by which the young people have to force the powers to be, to change policy, is the violation of just laws which requires inherent contestation, even physical and criminal. I'm torn. Any perspective that you could have uh, on that, I would appreciate. You can't answer it, but perhaps you might have a perspective on uh, that event. Thank you. And Phoebe, we should know that this yeah. gentleman, as best I can tell, is somewhere between 30 and 50. Yeah. <laughs> I was also going to say, I have been in churches with Extinction Rebellion and 350, 
and I've been part of this weekend planning process. So I, I do have some things to say, if you yeah. want to. I would like to hear uh, if Phoebe has something to share. Chris, if you would like to respond to, and then um, we'll move on to uh, Laurel's presentation. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. You can go ahead, Phoebe. I have like a different thought to the subject. Okay, so um, as I was saying, I have gone to those nonviolent direct action trainings. Um, I think 350 and Extinction Rebellion both do. So just those are both very different climate activist organizations. Extinction Rebellion, um, they're kind of best known for their international work. They started um, in the UK and Australia. They've like shut down the city of London. Uh, they're kind of known for gluing themselves to things. <laughs> um, and they are very much about, this summer they like shut down the streets in front of the New York Times building in New York City. Um, they're very much about putting capable bodies on the line. Um, and the way it's been explained to me in trainings with both 350 and Extinction Rebellion is that, kind of like I was saying, the this is a very urgent crisis. Our politicians are humans, which means they have compassion somewhere. Um, and they're also business people, which means they understand cost and reward. And so for young people to use and then especially, you know, young white people um, who aren't at risk of immediate, like, violence, um, to use arrest as a tool to send messaging that I understand, like, I mean, it's a big deal to get arrested, and that is how much my future is worth to me right now, and that's how urgent this crisis is, is that I will put future employment on the line. You know, I will have a permanent record at 19 because change needs to happen now, and lawmakers understand that. And so that's kind of the way the, the purpose has been described to me. Um, and there is always, 350 and Extinction Rebellion also do both um, go into really careful consideration thinking about, they wanna make sure their actions aren't disrupting, uh, you know, the working citizen, right? And that they are targeting the correct person. So this, um, what was it, Monday in Burlington, Extinction Rebellion put on what they called a swarm, where they ran out to the streets of Burlington for a very short period of time, made a ruckus, and then left. So as not to, you know, that, that's very strategic, so not to really, really hurt anybody's day, hopefully, but make enough of a noise that people are listening. Um, so, again, those, both those organizations are organizations that I personally trust, but it is a consideration to think about who are we, who are we targeting, um, in our actions. Yeah. Thank I think, you, Phoebe. I think just to paraphrase one part of your question has to do with this issue of just laws. And that's, that's a key to your quandary, is the difference between what you perceive to have been um, in the past using civil disobedience or civil obedience, if we want to call it that, to um, challenge what your perceptions of unjust laws were, as opposed to now, when what's being looked at are, it doesn't seem as clear that they're unjust laws, but what the laws are, are just, like uh, trespassing or something along those lines. So that's, I just wanted to bring up that that sort of sounded like the key to your dilemma. Sure. Right? It's, it, yes, but it's because the, what, what's happening is you're having to um, have two forces collide in a conflict, which, and we're wrestling with the concept of compassion. And I, I, feel, I feel very strongly that there needs to be a conflict. Um, and then, but we're trying to wrestle with compassion. So a lot of the actions intentionally put the police in conflict with young people. And how do we deal with that as compassionate people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank and, and I, your, your perspective is very helpful, and I'm sure yours is as well. Chris, do you want one minute before we move on to Laurel to respond to this? Oh, sure, sure. Um, so like, I've also been like, recently coming to like, grapple with that and grapple with that conflict and like I've been asking myself within that conflict has anyone from be it the um, the, the Extinction Rebellion or like from this the, the coal plant has anyone actually like had a conversation with one another because for me I 
consider that the coal workers, they're doing their job. They are having, that they didn't need to get paid because we, despite like the economy is growing, et cetera, et cetera, we are like the worst at economic disparity in the history of the United States. So I sympathize with the coal worker. I disagree with what they're doing, but I, I have to sit with they're doing their jobs. So I have to accept that, you know, like me wanting to protest what they're doing is risking what their livelihoods. So it begs the question of like, with unions basically being dissolved over time, that people power is taken away. And what the people becomes is the person, is the corporation that is doing all of these violations and they're like, goes to the courts and they're basically prosecuted as an individual. Take that away, bring the people power back, bring the union back and like have that conversation that like, okay, we know coal is bad. What are the alternatives and how can we get there through a just transition? So that, it's hard, it's very difficult. And I don't, I really don't believe that this continued fight of like two sides is productive in any way. I really think folks need to just kind of like understand where each party is coming from and the needs of that. Because if a coal worker comes to me and tells me that I can't afford to pay my electric bill if I don't go down, then either I ante up some sort of like, here, let me help you, or let them let their lights go out. So, that's our discussion. Thank you. Oh, what a rich conversation. Laurel, can you share with us which questions you chose? Well, actually, I looked at the question and then I went my own way. Okay. So, the book Drawdown, it's in at least 22 libraries in Vermont. It's part of um, why I'm here today. Jesse came to a training that I led, so I'm gonna try to set it here. I wanna take a couple of minutes and um, let you know just a little bit about me. I love the long view. I love getting a really different perspective on things. When I was in my 20s, I loved to climb mountains because from the top of a mountain, you get this incredible long view of the world. It's laid out like a map at your feet. I slept overnight on a mountaintop and got to watch the sunset and then the sunrise. Lovely. I also love to fly. I love to press my nose to the window of an airplane and watch the landscape change below me. I love that really long view. And one of the best chances I had for a change of perspective was in a dream. And I'm gonna put down the microphone and I'm gonna act it out and then explain to you what happened. The dream was about that long. I had the body of a large white bird and I was flying high up in the air and I looked with my, turned my long neck and I looked over my shoulder and saw the sun rolling off my feathers. It was beautiful. And it was about that long. That was a different perspective to have. <laughs> hmm. So, as she said in my introduction, I'm a farmer turned climate activist. And I'm really here to talk to you about the climate compassion, the climate crisis, and compassion from a worldview for, with this very long view that I take. This year I led nine of those workshops on uh, reversing global warming, introduction to drawdown to this information that's in this book. The, the book has a great subtext. I would just love to see it. how many people here have read drawdown or heard lectures about drawdown or participated in some way. Oh, only a few people. Well, there's good reading ahead for you. The book has a pretty amazing subtitle, The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming. The book presents, and the project, Drawdown, that, that put this together, presents a hundred existing solutions for global warming. If they were all applied at scale, they are convinced that it will reverse global warning, warming by 2050. Now, don't say that's not soon enough, I understand, but that's their aim. 
and it would only cost $74 trillion if we just got busy and did it. Well, think of what it would cost not to do it, I'm just saying, you know. Um, so it's a big job, and humans know what to do, and we're already working on it. These things are happening already um, around the world. So it's very exciting and very hopeful. If you're down about climate, um, check out from your local library or borrow from a friend their copy of Drawdown. Like the view from the mountaintop or out of a plane window, Drawdown has helped me shift my view to the to my perspective to that long view. So now I'm going to invite you to stretch your perspective past the end of global warming. When I do that, I think, ah, oh, a cooler planet, stabilizing climate, that, nah, that would be good to see. I would like to see that for my grandson and everybody else on the planet and other animals and all of life. But then what? Continued corporate rule? More business as usual with extraction of resources and human labor for profit? I don't think so. I think if we take the long view, we really have to consider climate crisis as not our only goal. We have to have much bigger goals than that. It is an important step. I have to say that. It's a step on our way to transforming our whole society. And so these, our themes are all melding together here. I like it. Creating a society where there's equitable, share, equitable sharing of resources, where the needs of all humans and all living things are taken into account, and that justice is shared. Those are all parts of the vision that I personally hold. So from this moment, what can I do to make that future become a reality? What is my role in the transformation of society? When I reach my mind out for the long view on climate, I really can go out in many directions, and it's a big view, but I end up coming around to my watershed and my community, my town, the people that I know. And in fact, I really believe that's the place where we have the most power, is to change what's happening in our town and in our neighborhoods. That's the place where we can take a stand, we can gather a few people, and we can speak truth to power. The question is, for me, how can I live my life to, be, to build that future world that I imagine? To create a world where there's unity with all people, everywhere, with all life on this planet, and that seeing that basic needs are met. And for me, to also take my humble place in the cycle of nature. There's a leader who I respect greatly named Marcy Rendon. She is a global leader for Native people. And she asks those of us with privilege to decide for this year to live on half of what we are accustomed to. And then next year, live on half of that. It, one thing it does is it helps you notice what you're used to expecting or anticipating or relying on as a resource. I see this as a personalized version of what the IPCC report last year said that we as a global community need to do with our carbon emissions, for instance. We need to cut them in half within now the next 11 years, and some people say our time frame's shorter significantly shorter than that. So imagine cutting just your carbon emissions in half this year. Something to think about. One way to cut your whole resource use in half fairly quickly is to share your living space and your food with someone who has nothing, say a climate migrant or an asylum seeker. So that's a compassion challenge that I'm putting out for you. What would you have to shift 
in your life to make a decision like that. What I'd like to do is a quick one minute each pair share. So turn to someone next to you, decide who has the longer hair. The person with long hair t gets to think and talk for one minute, and the other person will listen with good attention but not speak. And then I'll say, switch, and that means you change jobs. The one who is talking is, becomes the listener, and the one who is listening becomes the speaker. And take a, just a wild stab at answering that question. What would you have to shift to make a decision to share what you have with someone else for the next year? Okay, you ready? You turn to somebody? If anybody needs a partner? Chris needs a partner. Looks like they're calling you over. I go to Finish that sentence that you're on and then switch. communication workshop in a few moments so this can be continued As it is a much bigger conversation but let's come back together just letting your mind jump to that bigger perspective that was an invitation okay so I just love some feedback how was that good okay yeah okay not enough time. I totally get it, but I was trying to cram it in as part of my 10 minutes. So. so there are plenty of people in the world right now without, that do not have their basic needs met. I know we also have lots of other creatures to think about, but right now I'm going to focus on people. I haven't had trouble hearing. Yeah, if you could stop talking so everyone can hear, please. Thank you. Um, these rights are granted, basic human rights are granted by international law, but we're not meeting those needs. Many of these people would be glad to come to Vermont to live with you. A uh, recent um, study at Cornell predicts that by the end of the century there will be two billion refugees because of the situation with the environment. That's more than the current population of North America. South America, Europe, and Oceania. So we could have a lot of company. So it's a good thing to stretch your ability to have compassion about. Two years ago, my partner and I opened our hearts and our home to a family of three. They lived with us for, tw for 21 months, and most of the time was filled with the details of daily life, waiting with the kids at the bus stop, and what's for dinner. And some things were really, really good, and some things were hard. It was a human experience, a very good thing to do. So just consider how many people can move into your house. Um, another way that I've taken personal action to live towards the world that I want to be is I have decided not to fly 
anymore, even though I love the view out that window. Air travel uses an enormous amount of energy. It emits very complex um, greenhouse gases that have a long-term effect on the environment. And it is clearly a privilege. Only 3% of the population flew in 2017 of the world. 3% of the world population. So now I open my arms to the world and I fly only in my dreams. I invite you and I hope that you will find a long view that helps you find your ways to create the world of your dreams. So, thank you so much, Phoebe and Patty and Chris and Laurel for an incredibly uh, rich panel discussion, for taking the time to collect your thoughts in such a profound and carefully crafted way so that we could have such a meaningful um, discussion tonight. Um, let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs>